And you've got a survey, haven't you? Um, carried out a survey amongst your members about the effects of Brexit. And uh, I suppose mixed, isn't it? Because, of course, the fall in the pound benefits particularly those that are major exporters. Well, it benefits some exporters, that's right. I mean, we have to remember we've got a lot of companies who are importers who will be hurting right now because they're selling into the UK from overseas. We've got companies that use a lot of energy as well. They'll be hurting as energy prices start to tick up. And then you've got companies who are exporters but who import before they add value and export. All three of those are starting to say to us that there is a lot of pressure on them from sterling being as weak as it is. And what are they saying about hard Brexit? I mean, we heard from other organisations, business organisations, the CBI, the Employers Federation, saying that hard Brexit should be ruled out under any circumstances. Is that the way the BCC feels? Well, the beauty of representing 75,000 businesses is you get a lot of different opinions. And you do get a lot of different opinions about the, the type of political arrangement we should go for going forward. I don't I don't think any business wants to see a return to tariffs. I don't think any business wants to see lots of new barriers coming into their way in terms of trading with the rest of the EU. But where differences start to come is on the trade-offs of how you get there. Some businesses think one way, others think another way. I've got to be faithful to that business constituency and say they don't all agree. But the majority of them would like to remain in the single market, one would guess? I think the majority of them want the best possible terms of trade we can get with the single market, whether that comes via a negotiated agreement, a free trade agreement plus, or via the single market. They're less concerned with than seeing that the ultimate deal at the end of the day ultimately gives them the ability to continue trading with their colleagues across Europe. And how concerned are they about uh, another aspect of capital, human capital, about their ability to employ those skilled people they need from places other than the UK? Well, I think the thing that gets missed out in this debate is the efforts and the length which so many businesses go to to recruit in the UK before they're forced to look overseas. I've got companies who start up their own training academies. I've got companies who desperately work with local colleges to get the flow of people that they need, etc. And I think those are the ones who feel most concerned because they say, look, I've done everything I possibly could in my local community. Uh, I go abroad to look because I can't find the skills I need. It's expensive and it's bureaucratic but I do it because I need to expand my business. And I really hope that in future, a government's not going to stop me from doing that. That's the sort of concern that comes up from the businesses I represent. So then take that on board. And uh, what do you make of then what you've heard from the government, from Theresa May, from the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, last week? Does well, that chime with that view? Well, I got a lot of calls from business people who were extremely concerned about the comments at the Conservative Party conference, concerned that the flow of skills might be somehow squeezed, concerned that they would be asked to report on the percentage of foreign work for workers in their workforce. Those are not the sorts of things that give businesses the right signal or the right tone that Britain remains open for business. And I think there was a strong reaction against that. And we will be pressing the government uh, not to do anything that stops businesses getting the people they need, particularly when they're working so hard at home to train people. There's another dimension to this, isn't there? The uh, millions of EU nationals, other than those from the, the UK and Ireland, that, that are in the United Kingdom, yes. they want some assurances, don't they? Many of them working in key positions in major industries, and uh, that we're told by uh, Liam Fox they're, they're a bargaining chip. Well, we, we've been absolutely unequivocal on this. We don't want this to form part of the government's negotiation. We want the government to do the right thing for those individuals, for our businesses, and for the economy, and tell them all right now they're not under threat. That's hugely important to my companies who have EU workers in their workforce because one in 20 of them have already seen people leaving. One in 10 of them are saying they have people who intend to leave. And even more, almost, almost half are actually saying to us right now that they're worried about losing people. You don't want to be losing people who are trained up, ready to work in your business at precisely the time we've got to face some transition and change ahead. Now, what do you think about the, I mean, other things affecting business coming uh, out from the government, uh, the new government with Theresa May at the top? You know, you imagine the Conservatives are about the small state and the whole Brexit debate, a lot of that was about removing red tape. Yet then we hear that there are going to be uh, representatives from workers' representatives and other representatives on the boards of British companies. Are there any concerns about that or is that broadly welcomed? I think there's a concern about the thin end of a wedge. Uh, if intervention starts to happen in one area, whether it's corporate governance, whether it's the number of people you can have in your business, etc., etc., but then starts to expand to others. And then it expands from the FTSE 250 down into private businesses and indeed into SMEs and entrepreneur-run businesses. 
that's a real concern because what it suggests to you is government intervention is going to be massively on the rise within businesses at precisely the time ministers are asking businesses to power our exit from the European Union. That's but, my concern. But, but are your members saying that back to her, saying, hold, hold on a minute, we thought part of that whole Brexit debate on the Remain side was about a, a lighter touch to, to, to cut the red tape. Well, I, I think businesses understand that there's both good government intervention and bad government intervention. Good government intervention comes on things like getting the fundamentals right, like infrastructure, something that we're looking to them to provide. Bad intervention comes when, for political reasons, they take forward proposals that ultimately end up turning businesses off to investment, to hiring, or indeed to expansion. You want businesses to be ready and willing to seize opportunities and take risks right now, not become more risk averse. And that's what this is about. And lastly, for. you mentioned infrastructure. We're uh, going to be hearing from uh, the Chancellor, Philip Hammond, his autumn statement coming up pretty soon. And apparently we're going to hear a lot about infrastructure. That's the kind of way you'd be encouraging him to go? Of course. I mean, we have a huge multi-billion pound gap and deficit in our infrastructure. It's 40 years old. So they should green light those projects that the private sector is willing to pay for. And they should spend a little bit more public money on our infrastructure as well, dare I say. The Chancellor's got this new fiscal framework. It should accommodate more infrastructure, whether that's broadband, roads and railways. It gives businesses huge confidence. And actually, so much of the supply chain for that infrastructure is here in this country. Dr. Marshall, good to see you. Thank you very much Thank indeed, you. Adam Marshall from the British Chambers of Commerce there. And